Okay, thank you. Um, welcome everybody, good afternoon, to this BTS Young Members Lecture today. Um, we are proud to have with us Xi Shen from TIPSA, and he is going to present us a presentation on the selection of soft-based lab geometry and the middle of design considerations behind, titled Flat or Don't. She is currently the head of geotechnics department of TIPSA UK and Ireland. He is a chartered tunnels and underground tunnels specialist with 14 years design experience on mega tunneling projects including high speed 2, Thames Tideway Cross Rail and Brisbane Cross River Rail. He has considerable experience in providing technical and team leadership for delivering holistic designs combining geotechnics and structures for underground works. Without further ado, once again, thank you for being here and see. Welcome, and the stage is yours. Good evening, everyone. Let me know if the volume is right or not. Good. OK. So thank you very much for coming over tonight. I'm uh, really honored to be here, and really heartfelt thank you for you all coming to here. Um, so tonight, I bring you a battle between the flat base lab and the dome base lab. So there won't be any equations in this presentation, so you can just sit back and relax and enjoy a cocktail of knowledge. So I'm a firm believer of that you, you, you need to have the right framework of knowledge before you even delve into the equations. So hopefully by the end of tonight, I'll be able to offer you a framework of knowledge related to this uh, specific, specific issue. So let's uh, get going. Right, so this is, um, th these are the two contestants for tonight, the, the fight night. So you, you're, you're digging a shaft, and you have two options for the base lab. One is dome, and one is flat. Which one would you choose? Um, I need to firstly explain the loading condition here. Um, not everyone knows about it um, the, in very much details. So firstly, if you do a shaft uh, underground, it will be like a vessel. So if you push a bottle into your bathtub, it's going to float. So for the same reason, the base lab will tend to float as well. It will be subject to a lot of pressure uh, from underneath the base lab. Uh, depending on the ground condition, there may be heave as well, ground heave. So there are many reasons why a ground could heave. Um, in the geology of London, this mostly is likely to be consolidation heave. Which means, um, so fine, fine grain soil acts a bit like a slow acting sponge. So when you are digging a shaft, you are, you are digging out soil and you are unloading the soil underneath. So as soon as it's unloaded, it has the tendency of bouncing back. But because of the presence of the poor water in, in the soil, it's holding back the soil from bouncing back. So, but it's only holding it back temporarily. It will release it gradually. But usually the construction speed is much faster than the speed is getting released. So your base lab will be in there soon enough before the, uh, the full release happens. So because of the, the restraint from the base lab, it's going to stop the, the, ground water, the ground from bouncing back. That's where you get heave pressure from underneath the base lab. So with that in mind, um, these are the key design considerations I will run through tonight. Um, you don't have to go through this entire list because I will explain each individual of them. So let's firstly look at um, the structural behavior. Um, so firstly, the structural behavior for a flat slab is quite easily understood. It's just flat slab. Uh, it works in flexure. The material, the, the material of the base lab, which is usually concrete, it mobilizes the shear capacity to convert the vertical loading into horizontal stress flow. And you can see on the screen is the stress flow of a thick slab. But bear in mind that when the slab gets really thick, and as in the aspect ratio gets really low, and it will start to mobilize more and more the arching behavior than the shear behavior. So maybe in some cases, when the slab is really thick compared to the, the width or the length of it, uh, it may be more appropriate to model this as a stratum type. 
And down at the bottom left corner there, there are a few methods that are commonly used for concrete in flexure. But I just want to know that they are unlikely to be applicable to a thick, flat base lab. Uh, these include plastic hinge, uh, moment stiffness relationship, and moment curvature relationship. It, it, this is usually referred to as uh, M kappa relationship. Um, I've got some backup slides at the end, and we can, we can see more details about them if we have time in the end. So, the structural behavior for the dome is quite different from that of a flat slab. So, domes have been used throughout the history, and they are very famous for creating large span colony structures. Um, and we can also commonly find domes in tunnel structures as well. Um, so firstly, you have the shaft base lab, which could be in dome, uh, and you have the tunnel headwall, especially spray concrete line tunnel headwall. They, they are usually in dome shape. Uh, you also have some large caverns for underground structures, um, which take the shape of the dome as well. And I need to explain the uh, structural behavior of the dome in a bit more detail. So you can think of the dome as a myriad of different arches combined into a single strand. What I mean by that is, um, if you look at the picture on the bottom left, if you take a dish and put it upside down, and you try to compress it with your hand from the top, and it will tend to crack around the perimeters. And that's the behavior where it tends to split into individual arches. Um, so in the meridian direction of the dome, which means the up and down direction along the dome, uh, it will stay in compression, same as the, the arch. But in the hoop direction, it's different. Um, the upper half of the dome stay in compression, but the lower part of the, the dome will be in tension. There's a tension band at the lower half of the dome. Uh, this is a more scientific illustration of the stress distribution around the dome. So you can see in the hoop direction, uh, from the top, it, it stays in compression, but the compression gradually gets reduced as it goes down. And then at some point, it develops into tension and stay in tension, and the, the tension gets gradually larger as it goes down. In the meridian direction, it always stays in compression, and the compressive stress gets a little bit higher as it, it, it goes down. I um, just want to know that on this, uh, on this slide, there are a few things we need to discuss here. So firstly, if we look at the loading direction, for in the building structure, the loading is always vertically down or almost always. But in the underground structure, it could be different. It could be in the perpendicular direction to the dome surface. So that changes the dome behavior a little bit, which I can explain a bit further later on. And also, secondly, is the geometry half circle? This is a, this is a half circle dome. But what if it's not? What if it's shallower? the behavior will be slightly different. The general principles are the same. It still has a tension band, but the, uh, the distribution will be slightly different. And also, how about the boundary condition there? I have um, drawn in a simply supported um, arch, but what if it's, a, it's not a roller support at the other end? What if it's fully fixed? That, that, that's gonna change the behavior as well. And also, from a design point of view, you have a tension band. So how to analyze this tension when the, the dome is um, in concrete? And that's something to di discuss about as well. So that, let's firstly look at the lateral boundary conditions, as I mentioned. So on the, to, the, to, to the left is a picture, as I showed you in the previous slide. It's a simply supported dome. Uh, so it's, it's, it's in, it has a tension band at the lower half of the dome and this tension is in full. And compared to that, in the middle, you have a fully laterally re restrained dome. Uh, in this case, the behavior is quite different because it cannot move, it cannot move out horizontally. It, the whole dome will stay in compression in both directions. There is no tension whatsoever. Uh, but this is a very idealized situation. It's very hard to achieve that in reality. What's more realistic is the picture to the right. Um, you have uh, roller support at the bottom, 
uh, but you have loads of horizontal and uh, perpendicular springs to, to the dome surface. That's because usually for underground structures, you have um, soil on the outside of the dome, which acts as spring support to the dome. Uh, also, maybe uh, in certain situations, you have the dome, the base slab dome connected to the lining of the shaft, which provides further lateral restraint to the dome. So in this case, the tension, there is still tension, but the tension is going to be reduced. So let's have a look at uh, the concrete behavior in tension, because we mentioned there's a tension band at the bottom of the dome. So firstly, reinforce concrete cracks in tension. As soon as the tensile stress within the concrete exceeds the tensile stress limit of the concrete, it's going to crack. After it cracks, the stiffness will be substantially reduced because when the concrete snaps, the, the, the rebar is going to bridge over it. And what's left in, in the gap is just the rebar. There is no concrete left. When the, when the concrete snaps, it, it has zero, uh, zero stiffness in tension. Uh, this behavior is quite difficult to simulate. The crack behavior is quite difficult. It's, um, I, I will explain more on that further. Um, th there are, we also must know there are different analytical approaches between concrete in flexural tension and concrete in axial tension. And I'll explain on that too uh, later on. So in tunnel structures, we can commonly find axial tension in a lot of places, such as if you dig a shaft and you make a hole for the tunnel, you'll find um, axial tension along the two sides of the opening in the vertical direction. Uh, if you have a horizontal parent tunnel and it shoots out into child tunnel, you have um, horizontal tension forces to the, the, the top and bottom of that opening. Uh, and also you have that in the tunnel head wall as well because it is a dome and there's a, there's a tension band around its perimeter. So there are a few commonly used approaches for analyzing concrete in axial tension. Um, I've roughly sequenced this in ascending order um, as per their degree of complexity. So the first one is most commonly used uh, linear elastic approach. The problem with that, this approach is it doesn't take the cracking of the concrete into account. So even if the stress in the concrete exceeds the tensile stress limit, it stays uncracked. Uh, so the stiffness is a lot higher than what's, what's really there. So for underground structures, usually um, when the stiffness for an element is high, it will attract more loading. So from that point of view, the tensile force within the tension band is a lot higher than what's really out there. So from that point of view, it's a more conservative approach for concrete tension. Um, to mitigate that, um, that disadvantage for linear elastic, a lot of people use another simplistic approach, which is uh, linear elastic with artificially reduced stiffness around the tension band. And that's based on a theory called tension stiffening. I can explain that further. There is another approach for limiting the, for introducing a yielding criteria for concrete tension. You artificially introduce a cap to the, the stress the concrete is able to take. And depending on the approach, depending on how you use that, that data, it could be unconservative for, for some cases. So that, that approach needs to be used with care. Um, there is also a fourth one, the nonlinear elastic one. This is probably the most sophisticated out of the four I just introduced. Um, and I will explain on that further. Of course, there are more sophisticated approaches, uh, but they are not in common use in, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So I mentioned tension stiffening in there. Tension stiffening is about finding the right stiffness for, for concrete, for cracked concrete. So it's actually a concept not too difficult to understand. So concrete has almost zero axial stiffness in tension once it's cracked. Once it's cracked, it doesn't heal. It just stays cracked. It has no, no use in tension. 
But uh, as I said, the, the rebar will bridge across the, the crack. So the stiffness of the rebars remain fully. Uh, and also, uh, the, when the concrete cracks, it cracks in certain places. So outside these crack zones, the concrete will still bond to the rebar, and the stiffness re re remain fully. So from an overview point of view, from a, in a smear manner, the actual, the, the actual stiffness of the concrete when it's cracked sits somewhere between 0% and 100%. It sits somewhere in between those two, two scales, two extremes. So tension stiffening theory is about finding the right um, point on the scale for the cracked concrete. Um, I'm not, because of the time limit, I'm not going to delve too much into this topic. Uh, there are design guidance out there you can, you can, uh, you, you can look up. So let's have a look at the strain relationship from Eurocode 2. Uh, it gives us three different uh, strain relationship. One is bilinear, the other is parabola and rectangle. Uh, these two are commonly used for section analysis, but probably less frequently used for concrete intention. Um, there is a nonlinear stress strain relationship for concrete in there in Eurocode 2, uh, which is on the, the to the right of the screen. And I can expand a bit further on that. Uh, this is what I call a real uh, stress strain relationship of concrete. And bear in mind, it's not real, real. It's just closer to reality. So the, the concrete stress strain behavior stay as almost linear elastic upwards up until about 40% of its, uh, its capacity. And you can see after that, it, its uh, stiffness reduces slightly, uh, gradually, as um, the stress develops further. Um, up until its, tensile, its compressive stress limit, and then it takes a dip down. And that's a strain softening behavior for, for concrete. But ha have you noticed something on this, this, this stress-strain relationship which is missing? Um, have you realized that um, all stress-strain relationship for concrete in Eurico or whichever you place you, you can find, they are all on the compression side. But all the stress-strain relationship for steel is always on the tension side. So there's actually a bit of confusion as to the sign convention here. So the, the, you can see the tension bit here is missing. So I've drawn that for you. That's a missing bit. There's a little bit of a tail there for the, the, the tension behavior for concrete. And I will expand on that in, in a minute. So let's start with stress-strain relationship for concrete in tension for a unreinforced concrete. So unreinforced concrete is a, a very brittle material. You can see the stress-strain relationship goes roughly linear elastic up until a tensile, tensile stress limit of the concrete, and it just falls off a cliff. It just snaps, and that's it. There, there's no, no more capacity. That's why we don't normally use unreinforced concrete in, in structures. As soon as you put rebar in, it, it adds more ductility to the concrete. And this is a stress-strain relationship for reinforced concrete in tension. So you can see, after it takes on more tension, more and more tension, it firstly starts to develop some micro cracks, and you can see some hardening behavior as soon as it develops some micro cracks. And when, once it hits the first major crack, it, it falls off a cliff again. It's, it's a similar behavior as the, 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 the plain concrete. But then the reinforcement picks it up, and you can see it gets stopped, and then the stiffness goes up again. Um, but not for long. So it, it, as soon as the crack uh, widens, it's going to fall, fall, fall off a cliff again. And then the rebar picks up again, and then it fall, falls off again. It follows that pattern until the end of the usefulness of the concrete, where it's basically it, it just crumbles, it completely destroyed. What's left there in, in there is all, only the reinforcement. 
And in model code 2010, which is a very useful document, by the way, I recommend you to all read that if you're interested in concrete. So it gives us a strength strain relationship for concrete intention. It introduces a bilinear relationship for concrete once it's cracked. Uh, but be bear in mind, that's the in this uh, slide, it shows you the bilinear relationship for concrete for, for concrete only, for, for, for the, the concrete part of the reinforced concrete. But there's also reinforcement as well. So that's the stress strain relationship for the reinforcement. So reinforced concrete is a naturally composite material. So you've got to take into account of both the, 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 the stiffness from both parts. So in the end, you need to com combine the concrete stiffness with the reinforcement stiffness, and you end up with something uh, that looks like that. The curve roughly looks like that. It, not exactly, but that's, that's just my sketch. So bear in mind, in the design, use the composite stiffness for uh, re reinforced concrete. So I've talked a lot about concrete intention and how it cracks, and why does it matter for underground concrete? So we must firstly know that concrete naturally cracks. Um, it's OK. Um, co concrete, in a way, uh, it's, it's a bit like young, young children in that it needs a lot of care, a lot of nurturing environment. And if there's one tiny thing that goes wrong, it just cracks. Um, whether it's uh, too, too hot or too cold or too wet, too, too dry, um, too little reinforcement, too much reinforcement. In, in all those scenarios, it, it may crack, which is OK normally. But for underground concrete, it's, it's quite different. Crack leads to, um, so when concrete is uncracked, it's virtually impermeable. It's almost un, 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 in, impermeable, so which provides a lot of water resistance. As you know, underground, in the underground world, there's a lot of groundwater out there. So you need to provide some water resistance to the groundwater normally for underground structures. So when the concrete is uncracked, it's good. But when, once it's cracked, it, it, it will leak. So for, for that reason, crack, is, crack control is very important for underground structures. And it's usually quite challenging. Crack control leads to water tightness for underground structures. Let me expand on that. So water resistance of underground concrete structures, let me expand on that topic. Um, there are many ways to, pro to provide water resistance for underground structures. I've categorized them into three um, large categories. Uh, one is what I call explicit waterproofing. Uh, what I mean by that is you provide some waterproof membrane to tank it or you provide a cavity wall and you, you let it leak, but you drain away the leaked water. So what's inside the cavity is, is dry. So that's what I call explicit waterproofing. So you can provide a completely dry environment with that. Uh, there's also the second category where I call seepage prevention. What I mean by that is the, con the, the concrete itself is serving as the primary barrier for the groundwater but you need some treatment to it to, uh, to stop it from cracking. So you either add some add add mixtures into the concrete, into the concrete mix, or you apply some pre-stressing of, um, of the concrete. When the concrete is in compression, you can consider, consider it as uncracked. So there's a third category called crack self-healing. Um, what I mean by that is you control the crack of the concrete with reinforcement. Uh, to a, to, you control the crack width to a small enough number so that after it leaks for a bit, the fine particles in the groundwater or some residual chemical reactions will, will fill up the gap. So it, it will stop leaking after a while. So that's what I call self-healing. And that's permitted in the code, depending on your, uh, the, the, the category of your water tightness. So more on the crack self-healing concept. Uh, if you read Eurocode 2-3 for tightness class one, there are, it specifies, it differentiates between two different types of cracks. Um, one is called non-through crack. This is mostly coming from uh, concrete inflexure. 
So part of the section is in compression, and part of the section is in tension. For the tension part of the section, it will, it will crack and it may leak, but it will be stopped at the, the compression part. So there's no through water path. Whatever is out there, it doesn't leak through the entire section. So that section is, can be considered as a watertight section. Uh, but for the through crack section, the, the through crack scenario, it, it may come from an axial tension of the concrete. So the entire section is in tension. So as you can see, the, the cracks open up throughout the entire section, uh, creating water paths. And in that scenario, it, the water, groundwater will leak through the entire section. And this is the design crack width for underground concrete. You can see on that table there, normally for a non through crack, the, the crack width, allowed crack width, is up to 0.3 millimeters, normally, depending on the uh, design requirement. But for a through crack, you can see the uh, design requirement is very onerous. It's between 0 0.05 millimeters, which you can actually not see with your naked eye, and to 0.2 millimeters, depending on the hydraulic gradient. Um, in simpler terms, it depending on the pressure on the structure. So the higher pressure is on the structure, the less crack width you are allowed. So bear in mind that 0.05 millimeters of crack, crack width allowed is very, very onerous. You, you need to throw in multiple times more rebar compared to the 0.2. So as you can see here, for, for the domed base slab, which the, the perimeter of the slab is, um, is fully in axial tension, that through crack limit applies. But for the uh, thick flat ba base lab, the non through crack applies. So you can see the, the stress strain re relationship, as, as I showed you before, they're all based on stress strain. But the design requirement is always specifying crack width. So there's a problem where you, how to correlate between strain and crack width. Because um, it, at, at the end of the day, what you care about is the crack width. So again, we can resort to model code 2010, which provides a very good correlation between strain and, um, and, and crack width. So it uses a concept called tensile fracture energy. Um, it, basically, when the concrete cracks, how much energy it releases from, from the section. Um, you can see here, back to this diagram here, as I showed you before from Model Code 2010, the tensile fracture energy is the uh, right-hand side of the, uh, the diagram after it's, it's cracked. It's the area of, of that, that section there. Uh, there is another type of crack called um, restrained deformation crack. Um, this is used to be called um, early age thermal crack in the old days, but bear in mind this is not just early age and not just thermal. So I'm, I'm completely up for the name change there. It's, it's more accurate, calling it re restrained deformation cracks. So basically the principle behind that is concrete will lose moisture throughout its useful life. And as it loses moisture, it will shrink. And also there may be some temperature drop of the concrete, both during the curing process and throughout the, uh, the useful life of the concrete. So when, when the temperature of something drops, that, that element will, will shrink naturally. So there, there is the shrinkage there. And when it shrinks, well, uh, when it's restrained, when, when it shrinks, it will crack. So that, that's where the, the crack comes from. There are different types of restraint conditions. So there, there are three categories. Um, the first one is called end restraint condition. What it means is basically you cast a bit of concrete in between two very stiff elements. Um, it, both elements are, st stiff elements are restraining it from moving from, from either end of the concrete. So it has nowhere to go but to crack from the middle. There's another type of crack, uh, an another type of restraint called edge restraint condition. Suppose if you have a very thick base slab, and it's so thick you have to divide it into different pores. Once you have done the first pore, which is already hardened, um, you, you cast another pore on top. 
Um, because the hardened pore is already hardened and it has a lot of stiffness, it's restraining the, the, the new pore from moving, uh, providing a lot of lateral restraint. So the fresh pore of the concrete tends to crack. Um, as an, another case, if you have a really thick pore, but you do not divide it into different pores, um, because of the sheer size of the pore, um, as you know, the concrete uh, the concrete curing process is a, is a chemical reaction process. It releases a lot of heat. Um, as a result, this, the core of the section gets really, really hot. But the, 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 it loses heat around its perimeter, where it gets in touch with the, 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 the ambient temperature. So the, hot, the, 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 the core gets really hot, and then it, it will expand, and that cracks the perimeter. But once it's, the, the curing process dies down, it will cool back, so the, the core the, the core will will tend to have some opening cracks, and the perimeter will tend tend to go back. This is called the internal restraint condition. This is uh, a very very significant for thick pores. So as you can see, there are thermal issues for a, a very thick base slab pore. Um, so there are internal restraints for a large pore and edge restraint for pore if you divide the, the pore into multiple layers. Um, for a very big pore, you have excessive heat. Um, the problem with that is um, the, the, for underground structures, it's normally required to have very high durability, normally 120 years or so. Uh, the high durability requirement specifies a very high strength requirement for the concrete. Whether you need it structurally or not is another issue, but from a durability point of view, it's, it requires very high strength. Um, high strength requires you to have high cement content in the concrete mix, and it's the cement that releases heat, not, not the aggregate. So it will lead to a very high heat release. So as a result, for underground structures, wherever you have a very thick, thick element, it's normally desirable to have a very high percentage of cement replacement. This is usually done through, uh, for example, GDBS, uh, ground granulated blast furnace slag. It's basically a byproduct of uh, steel making. And it replaces the cement. It doesn't release heat. Uh, apart from those uh, design issues, I'd like to touch on a few uh, practical considerations as well. Um, with regard to reinforcement orientation, there are two different types of reinforcement arrangements. One is more conventional, is uh, or orthogonal re re reinforcement. Uh, nothing much needs to be said about that. The other one is a polar re arrangement. This is probably more natural to the dome base slab arrangement. Uh, as you can see, the rebar around the perimeter is organized in the uh, hoop direction, which maximizes their efficiency if, it, if it's a dome. Uh, if you remember, there's a tension band around the perimeter of the dome. Those rebar work exactly in, in the zone where they are needed. Uh, because it's, it's arranged radially, some, some bars are arranged radially, they cannot, if, if they meet in the middle, it's going to be really congested. So normally around the center, is, it goes back to orthogonal arrangement. There may be potential for prefabricating that rebar cage using the polar arrangement as well. Uh, there's another consideration related to applying the waterproof membrane. So to the, the picture to the, right, to the left is the picture of me trying to line my bowl with a bit of tin foil. And you, you can basically see it, it, it wrinkles. There is a lot of creases. Uh, that's the same principle if you, as you, if you apply a waterproof membrane to a dome base lab. It, it's, it doesn't wrinkle like that, of course, but it's more challenging compared to a flat base lab. The flat base lab is, has a flat surface. It's, it's a lot easier to apply a waterproof membrane there. Uh, there are some other considerations. As I touched on previously, the direction of the loading is what's, uh, what's thinking about for a dome base slab. So if the direction of the loading is perpendicular to the dome surface, it acts a bit like um, pre-stressing to the dome. It puts the dome into hoof compression. So that works more favorable to a dome base slab. 
uh, there is for underground structures, there is also a lot of uh, buoyancy uplift considerations. Basically, what it means is, um, as I said previously, if you push a vessel into the, uh, I into the water, it will tend to float. So there will be a lot of buoyancy forces going upwards. So to counteract that, from, from, uh, to prevent the shaft from floating, you need a lot of weight in, in, in the shaft. So the flat base slab has a lot of weight. It's, it tends to be more chunky. So it works more in the favor of the flotation calculations. Um, there's also health and safety um, consideration related to the dome base slab. As you can see, I've drawn it more exaggerated in the real scenario. But as you can see, if you put a plant there, it's, um, it's, it's an inclined surface. It won't, won't work very well. So how to, to activate that and how to, to construct the, the, the structure is what's, what's considerations. Uh, also, on the other hand, for the, the flat base lab, the reinforcement cage for the base lab tends to be quite big. And I've drawn a, a, a man roughly to the rough scale of the, that, that base lab. And you can see the scale of the base lab compared to the man. So it's basically much higher than, than the man. So workers will need to be working inside that cage, uh, when, especially when they are fixing the reinforcement mass. So some considerations need to be given in terms of the access to, 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 to the workers. So these are all the considerations I've, um, I, I, I've put forward. Let's sum them up. So for the dome base lab, I, I've only done pros here because one's pro is the other one's con. So the advantages for the dome base lab is um, basically it has less concrete pour, it has less excavation, um, less thermal effect, and the rebar cage tend to be smaller and lighter. There is option to prefabricate the rebar cage as well. I can explain a bit further on that. Whereas for the base, the flat base slab, there will be, if you are not using waterproof membrane and using the concrete itself as a water barrier, then there is no through cracks and that, that works more favorable. It has more weight, so it has more counterweight against uplift. It provides a flat working surface and it tends to have simpler details in terms of reinforcement. And also it's easier to apply waterproof membrane. So there, there you go. Um, so I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to take a few more minutes, if that, that's all right, George, um, just to show you some real life examples um, where you can think about your questions. Um, so the, these examples are based on publicly available information. So these are not TIPSA projects, so if I, I say anything wrong about them, please for, forgive me. Um, so that, that's an example of a flat base lab. Uh, I, I believe this is a crossrail Moorgate shaft. So just to put, into, put this into context, the depth of the shaft is around 40 meters. Uh, the width of the shaft is around 35 meters each way. So this is a semi-rectangular, circular-ish shaft. Um, and you can see the base slab down there is flat. Uh, I think by the look of it, it's roughly three meters thick. And you, you can also probably notice that the flexural force, the, the bending moment is high enough to warrant some tension piles down the middle. Uh, this is the reinforcement arrangement of, of that base slab. You can see the reinforcement is quite heavy. Uh, the, the, the top mat has three layers of B40s in each direct direction. So that's six layers uh, in total. Uh, it's so heavy that you need some proper uh, bracing to, 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 um, to, to ensure it's not swaying uh, to e either way. Uh, also, to the picture, on the picture to the right, you can see uh, the, the size of that, that, that rebar cage. And uh, you can also see a forest of shear links through, through the slab. 
this is the access issue, as I mentioned before. Um, because of the sheer size of that, that, that rebar cage, people need to get into the cage to fix the reinforcement. So you have to leave an access hole uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, that's the uh, access hole there. Um, to ensure they have, they have safe access into the bottom mat for uh, doing the work or for doing the, the inspections. Um, this one is a real life example of a dome based app. This is uh, Thames Highway East, uh, King Edward Memorial Park shaft. This shaft is a circular shaft, is roughly 60 meter deep uh, and about 25 meter in diameter. Uh, what this picture is showing you is during the, the, the uh, assembly process of the base slab reinforcement. You can see it's, it's, um, they are halfway through. What they've done is um, they've divided the base slab uh, reinforcement into, uh, into different slices of a pizza. So they, they, have, they are halfway through. They've assembled three slices already on site. They are waiting for the other three to be assembled. Um, what they do in between the slices is they, they slot some uh, splicing rebar through to make it a continuous hoop. And this is a picture showing you a slice of the pizza, uh, basically. Uh, on the, the picture on the right is where it's assembled upright on site. That's a trial. And you, you can see it, it, um, that the, the, the bottom surface is quite inclined. So it needs some pedestals there to, to stabilize it and prevent it from sliding. Uh, this is a picture showing you the prefabricated, prefabricated cage during the transport. And that picture is showing you a trial assembling process uh, where they are trying to join up the two slices. Uh, and what, what they are doing is, um, actually, the next picture shows you a better, better picture. So, so you can see down here, um, these are the splicing rebar there in between the, in, in between the slices. So they slot in this splicing rebar, and, and uh, they will be lapped into, the, um, into either side um, and make it a continuous hoop. So there you go. Uh, the, the, these are the, our two different arrangements. Ho, ho, which one is your winner? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and now it is the time to pick the winner and have a Q and A. I I know we have a couple of microphones here, so Hello. With the domed surface, um, like, do, are the contractors opposed to it just because they don't have a flat surface to work, or are they? Does the angle not? Sorry, I can't it? hear. You. Are the contractors? Oh, are they like opposed to the idea of a domed surface because they don't have a flat surface to work on? Oh yeah, we we need to work jointly with with, with the contractor to to define a preferred option. Yeah, that we we need to work very closely to the contractor. They they need to decide whether that slope surface is too much for them or is that acceptable. It needs to fit, fit into their working methodology and wh whatever machinery they have on site. And in your experience, have they had like a limitation in terms of like uh, Not in my experience. Um, I think all the dome slabs I have experienced so far, they, they all worked out all right on site. Uh, which is good, so <laughs> yeah. But it's just a, a consideration to, to be done. It's not necessarily a showstopper. It's not saying that surface is too hazardous or anything like that. It's just saying, you know, you have to consider the inclination of the ground during, during construction. Yeah. I see. Um, yeah. So interesting, kind of, I was going to follow on from, or say something that follows on from that. Um, 
in that when uh, I had spent some time on site and in some more colourful language than what I'll use here, the foreman was complaining about the curved slab. Right. Um, and I was trying to extend the virtues of it being efficient and, and good design um, and using less materials. But it, his view was that in the time it took them to profile the base, put out those pizza slices, put them, slice, splice them together, um, mm -hmm. he could quite easily have got his guys to dig an extra five metres and filled with a lot of it with concrete. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, whilst we work with the, the higher ups of the contractors and they have their views on what's, what's an efficient and good design, it was just interesting to get the, the other end of it from mm -hmm. the guys on the ground. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting to see the foreman's view. Um, yeah, I'll say there are a couple of points uh, I can pick on in, in terms of his opinion there. Um, firstly, you, you're quite right. A dome base up is probably using less material compared to a flat one. And that works in his favor, didn't it? It's, um, so it, he's doing less work compared to a flat base lab. Uh, and also, he said um, there are more, there's more excavation, if I remember correctly, uh, which is not necessarily correct. So it's, you, you have to do the excavation anyway. It, it, what, what matters is the, the finished surface. And um, what's under there is, uh, is basically the, the structural concrete. Uh, the dome base lab is, is curved, and you, you, you probably need to backfill uh, it to the, uh, the, the finished surface level. And that's probably where he saw there was more concrete. But it, that concrete is to be used as weight, the, the counterweight to uplift. That, that's not going to, in, into waste or anything. So it's not actually more excavation. That, that's what's required. Ha, so, you, sorry, not more, um, the, the actual profiling of making the shape yeah. took them so long. He was like, well, I right. could just keep digging and make a big plug. Um, yeah, yeah. In terms of the setting out, yeah, the dome one is probably more difficult than, than the flat one. Um, but I think we we just as we do more dome base lab around London, people will get more and more experience with that, and it will get easier and easier. So I again, I don't think that's a major consideration. So. It's, yeah, it's, it's harder to, 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 to set out. I take that point. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, very interesting, that. Um, simple question to start off with. Considering you've got compression through the uplift forces and you've got curvature, and I call it curvature rather than domed, I'll explain mm. in a moment. Okay. Surely you could have a situation where the bending moment's low, the compression's high, you don't need any reinforcement at all. Um, yes, if you have a really, really deep dome, dome base lab, maybe that's the situation. Is that, is that what you mean? Well, no. <laughs> okay. In 1997, I designed a stormwater search shaft for Thames water. Mm. 15 metres diameter, 90 metres deep at the centre of the curve base. It was a one pass spray concrete lining, mm. no secondary lining. Spray okay. concrete base, no reinforcement in the base, okay. just steel fibres for early thermal cracking. It had undercuts okay. at the base to avoid uplift. Mm. And it was a 30% saving in cost and a 50% saving in construction time. So I think you've got a long way to go here. There's a lot more that people... What concerns me more is that we're here talking about an idea that was done not in 1997, mm. but in the 1850s by Brunel on the sumps to the Thames Tunnel, which got a curved base and undercuts. I only found mm. out about that a few years ago. Okay. What is important here is that we actually get across to people that there's a lot more that can be done with this. Mm. Um, so you don't need reinforcement. I've done it. Right. 
I, that's amazing. I uh, yeah, I, I love to see the more details about that project. It's, yeah, um, but I, I suppose you you need a dome deeper than what was. Okay. On the contrary, you've explained very nicely the tension effect of a dome. Mm -hmm. Now, I consider the dome, as you've shown, as a half hemisphere. Mm -hmm. If it's flatter, which overcomes the construction problems, mm -hmm. then it is, a sh it is because it's shallow. Now, I published in the second BGA conference in 2008 a paper that shows how you can work out the optimum base radius so you've got virtually no bending at the middle, and therefore you don't need reinforcement. Okay. So we may wish to take this forward with the young members at some other time. Mm. Because I've got too many other points to discuss, we'll be here all night. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, that's amazing, thanks very much for sharing that with us. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very much interested in reading that paper. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. This is not not the probably not the most optimal solution. Uh, but it, with some further considerations, we could potentially el eliminate the reinforcement there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, are there any other questions? Not from the audience here. Let's check the YouTube. Thomas, do we have any questions on the YouTube? Tom? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> that, that's great. I cannot see it. Do you have a mic up there? I can show it to you. <laughs> Fire away. Okay, yeah, uh, so I can repeat the question here. Um, so it's basically, the question is, in the polar arrangement of the base lab rebar, how do you arrange the centerpiece of that base lab, which is in the orthogonal uh, direction? Uh, so yeah, that, that, that centerpiece is basically lapped into the, um, the, the polar arrangement around the perimeter. So it has um, it has a lapse in between the uh, the the orthogonal bit and the polar bit, um, so it will extend a bit further than the uh, region where it's required, just because of the the, the lapping. Um, I hope that that answers the question. Thank you, thank you, Shay. Okay, and that concludes it. A couple of slides regarding some BTS and BTSYM announcements. Next slide, please. Yes, so <clears throat> in the 21st of April, we have the Harden Prize presentation. That is going to be held in person here at uh, 6 in the afternoon. Next slide, please. Friday, the 29th of April, we are going to hold a, an online lunchtime webinar in a joint effort with the Tiny Association of India Young Members. And currently we are deciding on dates to hold similar joint webinars with the Australian Tunneling Society Young Members and as well a webinar on discrete event simulation model for predicting tunnel bore machine utilization. Um, that is from WSP US. Of course, uh, you can also keep an eye to our social media accounts. On Thursday the 19th of May, one day before the BTS YM conference, we are going to have the BTS annual gathering meeting and the evening meeting afterwards in person here. And next slide, please. On the 20th of May 2022, we are going to hold the BTS Young Members Conference. 
I, yes, another um, announcement is that this year the British Science Society Design and Construction course is going to be held on the 4th of July until the 8th at the Warwick University and booking is now open. You can visit the British Science Society website for more. And uh, there is also currently ongoing work on the BTS 50, 50th anniversary book. Next slide, please. Um, I guess anyone who has volunteered to contribute or help in any way is receiving communication. So please do keep an eye. Uh, currently, we are finalizing the page setting illustrations and uh, look out for requests seeking photographs or any other material. The program, the target, is to open for pre-orders pre in May and the print is going to take place in August later this year. Next slide. Yes, a few roles for volunteers. Please uh, do visit the BTS site and uh, if you need to volunteer, contact the people responsible for that. And next slide. Yes, the, um, our social media account, please do subscribe, keep an eye out. We are going to have several events, not only webinars or online lectures, but also socials and site visits. So thank you once again for attending. Thanks once again, C, for uh, this excellent comprehensive presentation. And hopefully speak to all of you afterwards. Thank you.